Sunday, August 16th, 2020, Kingsland, Georgia. Just before 6 in the morning, thieves break into the pickup truck belonging to NASCAR driver Mike Harmon. The engine fires, and the truck drives off into the darkness. Towed behind it is a trailer containing one of Harmon's race cars, plus pit equipment representing half the team's entire inventory. Three years later, the perpetrators are still at large, and not one lug nut has ever been recovered. Perhaps you can help. Join me. You may be able to help solve a mystery. You may know Mike Harmon for this famous tweet, which he posted after words were exchanged following his on-track incident with Michael Lynette at Indianapolis. What you may not know is that in 2019, the year this tweet was posted, Mike Harmon Racing was showing significant signs of improvement. It had been more than 11 years since Harmon had earned a career-best finish as a driver in the NASCAR Xfinity Series, a 17th place finish he earned at Talladega on April 26, 2008. By 2019, Harmon was 61, and as he focused more on operating his team, other drivers took the wheel. The first of these to break through was Nicholas Haman, who at Road America that August came home 15th, a new team best. Harmon had also joined forces with Rick Ware Racing, which brought on two of Ware's drivers, who were each part-timers in the Cup Series, 23-year-old Bailey Curry and 22-year-old Kyle Weatherman. At Kansas in October, Weatherman came home 22nd. Two weeks later, Curry finished 20th at his home track back in Texas. Bringing on Curry and Weatherman seemed to rejuvenate Harmon's team. In the 2020 opener at Daytona, Harmon himself bested his 2008 finish by taking home 16th, following the draft of teammate Joe Nimichek in 15th. To date, this remains Harmon's best Xfinity finish as a driver. Through the following weeks, Harmon phased both Curry and Weatherman back into the lineup. The momentum continued through the pandemic's postponements, on the other side of which Curry finished 18th in Charlotte and again in Atlanta. Weatherman joined Curry for Homestead's doubleheader in June, where each scored stage points on consecutive days. On Saturday, Weatherman finished 6th in Stage 1, while on Sunday, Curry took 10th in the opening segment of his race. A friendly rivalry seemed to take hold. Weatherman took 15th at Pocono at Indianapolis. Curry took 20th at Bristol and 19th in his return to Texas. And on July 9th at Kentucky, where Curry was 22nd, Weatherman stormed through the field in the final laps to finish in 8th, the Harmon team's first top 10 finish in 280 combined entries across 12 seasons. Yeah, it was good. It was really good. We, we ran good all night. Kyle drove the wheels off the thing. We saved our best set of tires for the end and Dawson fell just right, and we got all hooked up, and um, everybody was on the bottom, and uh, he decided to go to the outside and, and gain several spots on the outside, you know, before before they anybody caught on that they was outside out there, you know. So it, it was that was really good. We uh, we outran him, really outsmarted him too. Hey, it was a, it was a big night for us, big night. By mid-August, Harmon looked to keep this momentum going into NASCAR's first Xfinity race on the Daytona infield road course, the Uno 188. Harmon's team entered 2020 with just seven cars in its inventory, three for Curry's number 74 team, three for Weatherman's number 47 team, and one spare to be shared by both drivers. Only two of these cars were set up for road course racing. Weatherman's number 47 began its life with Viva Motorsports, which closed in 2015, and the car was then sold to Precision Performance Motorsports, owned by Rick Godovic. It was in this car that Parker Kligerman scored a 10th place finish at Road America in 2017. When Godovic closed his team that year, Harmon's crew blasted and powder-coated the chassis, put on a new body, and dropped in a new motor. Both this car and Curry's number 74 also carried sponsorship from RepairableVehicles.com, which expanded their sponsorship from fellow underdog Jeremy Clements. The deal began in Indianapolis, continued through their road course portion of the schedule. At the request of the company owner's wife, both cars carried the message Stand for the Flag, a response to the ongoing controversy regarding protests of the national anthem. 
With metric qualifying still in place during the pandemic, Weatherman secured 26th on Daytona's grid, ahead of Curry in 34th for the race on Saturday, August 15th. On a damp track, under dark skies, and in front of empty grandstands, both teammates struggled early on the wet weather tires. By lap six, both had switched back to the dries, which soon dropped both off the lead lap and put Curry into last place. Curry climbed out of last on lap eight, while Weatherman battled for the lucky dog, which he earned when the first caution fell on lap 14 for Ross Chastain's stalled car. In the two-lap sprint to end stage one, Curry also earned the lucky dog, and just like that, both Harmon cars were back in the race. On the lap 18 restart, Weatherman held 21st, with Curry the 28th and final car on the lead lap. Both improved to 13th and 20th by the end of stage two. With 10 laps to go, they were still on the lead lap in 18th and 20th, when Earl Bamber wrecked on the backstretch, drawing the sixth caution of the afternoon. There would be only seven laps to go on the restart. Well, it just worked out where we didn't pit. The tires we had wasn't much better than what was on the car, and we was going for track position, and, you know, it, the guys wasn't used to them being there in the front. Harmon rolled the dice and kept both his cars on the track. Only one other driver did, Myatt Snyder in RSS Racing's number 93. But Snyder would start third, as both Harmon cars were now on the front row, Weatherman in the high lane with Curry down low. Both had their work cut out for them. Leading the fresh tire brigade to Snyder's outside was Chase Briscoe, followed by Austin Sindrick and A.J. Allmendinger. Between them, these three drivers had won a combined 10 of the season's 18 previous races. Curry Weatherman and Snyder up there on old tires, spinning the tires on the restart. There you see it, the 98 to the outside. He's going to try to outbreak these guys all the way down the corner. And Allmendinger is going to shove the 47 into the corner. They're all going to miss it. They all miss the corner. They all tuck themselves in the out. <laughs> oh, oh, big contact. Yeah, big contact here. And yeah. falling way back now. Almondinger in the 98. Oh, oh, we got a car spinning. The 36 hard into the guardrail. The 98's around. Briscoe with damage to the 98. And I, I forgot who it was. I think they're running cup now. They actually pushed one of them out of the way, and it caused a big mess. It wasn't really our fault because they, they didn't. They did it in the center of the corner where they shouldn't have. If they had just raced a while, they could have passed and went on. But they didn't do that. So, you know, we see a lot of that nowadays. That's the way you do it. You got to go for track position. You got to try to outsmart them. And we were in a position to do that. And then we got shoved out of the way. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I probably would have done it myself, but I would have done it a little cleaner. Despite the incident, both Curry and Weatherman rejoined the race, still on the lead lap. And for the first time all day, Curry ran ahead of his teammate, holding 25th to Weatherman's 26th. While some may be critical of the Harmon team's decision to stay out, it was the leaders who had the most trouble on the track. Oh, we got one back around. Here. Buford's going to go around in the 07. It looks like he had some help. They stack up behind him. Goodness. Big wreck behind him. There's a lot right, of here. spots right there. After this incident, Curry moved to 15th with Weatherman in 19th. Both continued their climb to the checkered flag. Across the line, Curry took 14th, his new career best, improving on his 18th at Charlotte in Atlanta. Weatherman's 17th place finish was his fourth top 20 finish of the season and his first since his own career best eighth in Kentucky. After the race, the Harmon team loaded up in preparation for the following week's doubleheader in Dover. Unlike many of the Xfinity teams, Harmon's didn't own a tractor trailer, but instead two gray trailers, the larger of the two for the number 74, the smaller for the number 47. Each towed by its own Ford Dually, the two trailers contain not only the race car, but all its pit equipment, including gas cans, generators, and radios, everything except what NASCAR provides them to race. This allowed the team to turn around both trucks without having to swap out equipment from one trailer to the other. The plan had been to stay another night in Daytona, then make the trip back to Charlotte in the morning, but two full-time crew members wanted to get a head start. Reluctantly, Harmon let them drive the number 47 trailer back north. Driving the team's silver 2000 Ford F-350 dually, the two made it 127 miles north before pulling off at Kingsland, Georgia at the three-mile marker. Just off Interstate 95, the two checked in at the Super 8 Motel. And though the Super 8 had enough parking, they instead parked the truck on the other side of the road in the lot belonging to the Cracker Barrel. 
According to Harmon, the two didn't let the tongue of the jack down to keep the weight of the hauler off the back of the truck. Instead, they grabbed their things and turned in for the night. The next morning, August 16th, the hauler was gone. The crew members contacted Harmon, who at 9 a.m. posted the following details on his team's Twitter page. He then drove up I-95 in the number 74 hauler on his way to Kingsland. Along the way, he kept his eye out for the other hauler, but never saw it. It's unlikely he could have seen it anyway, as trees along the median blocked the view of opposing traffic. Harmon arrived in Kingsland, where he filed the police report. Together, they went to Cracker Barrel, where they watched security camera footage from the night before. They saw the hauler leave at 5.58 a.m., then head back south on I-95. And I don't know how far they went on 95. They may have turned and went on 10. But, you know, there's an agricultural station there. There's cameras all around. And they said they had no pictures of anything. If he'd had a crash, you know, there'd been pictures of it on the news. At the time, Kingsland's police department was understaffed with just three officers on duty. They stayed at the scene for the next three hours until the shift change. With no leads and no one Harmon suspected of committing the theft, the police told Harmon and his team they may as well head back to Charlotte. In the investigation that followed, both crew members were cleared as suspects and were later released by the team. Harmon stayed in touch with local authorities, but that did not achieve results. They were supposed to ping the phone and see who was there for a short amount of time, around 5.50 a.m. to 5.58. That never happened. And they said, well, it's going to, you have to pay for that. I said, well, I'll pay for it. And then I agreed to pay for it. And they said, well, it'll take about a year. I said, well, a year's better than nothing. But it never come, never did it. And then one of the officers that was really trying to help, all of a sudden he disappeared. No no return call, no, no, you know, no nothing. And then I sent the county an email, not the city, but the county an email. And I got a call from two or three deputies on a combat call and said, well, well, Mike, you know you'll probably never see that thing again. With no word from authorities and no responses on social media, Harmon put up a $5,000 cash reward. He then increased it to $10,000, then $20,000, but all he got were a couple prank calls. Harmon then paid for a half-page ad in Kingsland's newspaper, including pictures and full details on the equipment, and ran it for a week. Still nothing. And for six months, Harmon fought with Geico over his claim. And I was like a lot of other people. And I, uh, I thought when it was hooked to the truck, it was covered with insurance. But that's not true. With most insurance companies, there's a lot of people got education over it. And I got an expensive education over it. It's good for a crash, not fire and not theft. With most insurance companies, when you got it hooked to your, to your truck. And I didn't know that, and so did a lot of other people didn't know that. You know, you just took for granted that it was hooked to the truck, it was covered. It's, it's a tremendous loss for us. Sure. The, the car itself, I mean, it was easy $150,000 car to be as fresh as it was and to be as complete as it was. The police report put the value of what was lost at $400,000. Harmon recovered just 13000 and much of that money was spent paying back the expense of the rented gears and shocks that were on his missing race car. The car's seat, custom-made for Kyle Weatherman, cost $6,000 alone. All the team's best parts were put on these two cars. To lose one of them, and all of its necessary equipment, was devastating for the team. Mike Harmon Racing did manage to enter both its cars in the next race at Dover, thanks to the help of a few teams Harmon prefers not to name. Thanks to their strong runs at Daytona, the metric ranked Kyle Weatherman and Bailey Curry 16th and 20th on the grid for the first race. And while Curry fell out early with the loss of fuel pressure, Weatherman finished 25th. Some other team helped us out some with pit, pit equipment. We actually had an extra pit box, and we just did the best we could, you know. Well, there was some that, you know, let me use gas cans and stuff like that that we lost. And we do that for each other, you know, especially in a situation like that. We managed to do it, you know. We got it done and did pretty well. Both teams scored a few more top 20 finishes to close out the year. On the 47, Tim Veens finished 18th on Daytona's Oval, followed by Joe Nimichek's 16th at Talladega, while Weatherman took 19th at Texas and 17th in Phoenix. Harmon himself drove the 74 to 17th place finishes on the two super speedways, while Curry took 19th at Richmond, 18th in Kansas, 12th at Texas, and 15th in Phoenix. Harmon's team had finished the season, 
but there was still no progress in his case. In fact, he was told by authorities that he'd never recover what was stolen. Even the race car, which fellow team owner Jonathan Cohen had managed to recover following a similar incident that also took place in Georgia in 2015. Harmon did hear about a crime ring working from Jacksonville to South Carolina, which targeted both F-250 and F-350 Ford trucks, which in late 2020 gave him an idea. In November, Harmon drove another dually to the Turkey Rod Run in Daytona. On his way, he parked the truck next to the same Cracker Barrel in Kingsland, looking to recreate the circumstances of the theft. When the police declined to help, Harmon disabled the truck's ignition and had some friends staked out to watch if anything happened. I had a Navy SEAL that was going to go, but he got COVID. I had a brother-in-law that was going to go, he got sick. So I had to take just two of my guys. One of them was going to get in a trailer, see where they went. He fell asleep, didn't get in the trailer. One of them stayed in the car behind some hedge bushes. And that night, when he fell asleep also. It was like 4 o'clock in the morning. Because I was going to go out at 5 myself. Because they say they get them like in the early morning. So it won't be noticeable when they leave with it. You know, if you leave in the middle of the night in a motel, it's kind of fishy. Early in the morning, it's not. But anyway, I heard him yelling, screaming. And I went running out, and uh, the guy had the truck running. And when he started yelling at him, he opened the door, jumped out, got in another view, and took off. Went the same direction that mine went when they stopped. The truck was still running. The door opened, two pounds of sledgehammer in the floor. The switch where they broke it out was all in the floor. Had an eight pressure. They took those with them, but they didn't find no fingerprints on That's what I was talking didn't find no fingerprints on the truck. The guy did not have gloves on when he jumped out and ran. Herman didn't catch the perpetrators, but did discover how easy it was to steal an F-250. The would-be thief had his truck's engine fired in less than three minutes, and Harmon had to drive the truck home with a screwdriver in the ignition until he could get the part replaced. They stole it in August, and then they tried to take this other one in November, but I was making sure they weren't going to get hit, but I was trying to get them caught. And tr- trust me, I had a, v- a chase vehicle there. I, I mean, they wasn't going to get away, I promise you that. I know how to wreck people, <laughs> and I would have done it, you know, just to, call, just to got them caught. But it didn't happen, and the police didn't help us. To this day, more than three years later, the whereabouts of Mike Harmon stolen goods remains a mystery when that confounds him when August comes around. I'm hoping maybe a distraught employee, a distraught girlfriend, you know, a lot of things change in three years. If it brought back to the mind, oh yeah, I remember what happened. If you, you know, uh, outside, out of mind. And, And how do you keep today's times, how do you keep that quiet for so long with social media and all that and a $20,000 cash reward. It don't make sense. It don't make a lick of sense. And I, I just think there's somebody one of these days going to talk. And probably, but would I get anything back or not? I'd at least, I don't know what happens. If you or someone you know has information on the whereabouts of Mike Harmon's stolen race car, truck, trailer, or equipment, send Mike an email at mikeharmonracing74 at gmail.com.